Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to our public lecture today. And our guest speaker today is Dr. Thomas Finnegan. Tom is a lecturer in theology and religious studies at Mary Immaculate College. He graduated with a bachelor in theology from St. Patrick's College, Maynooth, and he received a master's in arts from University College, Dublin, and he did his PhD in Trinity College, Dublin. His area of expertise focuses on philosophical theological ethics, with a particular focus on bioethics, freedom of conscience, and religion and equal moral status. He's a keen interest in philosophy of religion and in the philosophy and theology of religious education. He's published numerous academic articles and his research in a range of international peer reviewed journals, including the Oxford Journal of Law and Religion, Louvain Studies, the Journal of Medical Ethics, Religious Studies, Bioethics, Medical Law International, the Australian Journal of Legal Philosophy, among many others. He's a member of the Bioethics Consultative Group of the Irish Catholic Bishops Conference, and he's a member of the Working Group on Religious Education at Post-Primary Level of the Council for Catechetics of the Irish Bishops Conference. It's a great privilege, Tom, to have you with us today to speak on getting pluralistic about pluralism. Thanks. Thanks, Trish. Hello, everybody. And uh, thanks to all involved at the um, Irish Institute for Catholic Studies for having me here. Great privilege and honour uh, to be presenting to you today. So I'm going to uh, speak on the topic of pluralism and um, I'm, I'm making a case for something. And I really appreciate feedback, critical feedback, especially on, on, on what I present today. If uh, there are aspects of what I say that um, aren't convincing or problematic or inaccurate or anything like that, I'd, uh, I'd really appreciate feedback on it. It's a, it's a slightly, it's a new foray into an area and uh, Trish is helpful to me in just kind of pointing out a few of the important works in this particular area. Um, you can all see the PowerPoint slides I take it at the moment? Yes. Great, okay. So. It's on pluralism and it's um, the, the main point is that pluralism itself as an idea, as a concept, while it's very, very important, it's equally important that we clarify what we mean when we invoke pluralism as a concept and that it's important to uh, disaggregate um, the different senses of pluralism and that by doing so we get clearer in terms of our analysis of uh, pluralism in whatever sphere we're talking about. And the sphere we're talking about here today is really education, in particular, religious education. So I'm going to begin by trying to offer, propose <clears throat> a schematic outline of pluralism. OK, and I'll take as a, a kind of a base text, a useful text that I, I came across in my research for today. And uh, this is from uh, Nugent and Donnelly. They're making a case that only secular schools respect every person's human rights equally. And this is from a very helpful publication uh, co-edited by uh, Trish Kieran. And you can see the reference there at the bottom. So they begin by saying in a pluralist society, the only way for an education system to vindicate everybody's right to freedom of conscience, religion and belief and to respect the convictions of all parents as opposed to the majority is to establish a state secular education system that is neutral on the question of religion. They go on to say uh, the European Court of Human Rights has stated that the Travaux Preparatoire of Article, that's the preparatory works that go into the making of the particular founding document of the court, which is the European Convention, of Article 2, Protocol 1, which is the right to education, of the European Convention aims at safeguarding the possibility of pluralism in education, which possibility is essential for the preservation of a democratic society as conceived by the Convention. And a little later on, just the next page, uh, they say non-religious parents <clears throat> must identify the areas of each particular subject and lesson that is uh, not delivered in an objective, critical and pluralistic manner. They're talking here about ORE as done through denominational schools, so Catholic schools, uh, and then try to seek exemptions for the children. The idea being that that sort of ORE, it's not, according to the authors, objective, critical and pluralistic, and therefore non-religious parents uh, will object to it. 
and um, they, that places a burden on them to kind of screen their children's religious education so that their children aren't um, unduly influenced by views about religion that non-religious parents don't hold and don't share. Okay, so I'm going to return to this a couple of times during the talk, uh, this text, and you can see there's uh, three instances of pluralism being invoked, and I'm suggesting that those three instances of pluralism connote very, very different things, and they seem to be conflated here in what the authors are doing, and that conflation uh, masks, I think, a, I, I, I would suggest an incoherence. Okay, so what I'm doing here is, is nothing that hasn't been highlighted by, by others. Uh, so for example, in the same um, work, Terence Merrigan says this, the precise meaning of this term pluralism is, however, by no means self-evident, and one would do well both to examine the somewhat disparate cargo this word carries and the port of call it is designed to reach. Those who sail under the flag of pluralism, pluralism should be challenged to explain what precisely they mean by the term and what they hope to achieve. Okay, and then in that same work over the next couple of pages, Merrigan helpfully goes on to try and unpack the different senses uh, in which pluralism can be meant. And while there's nothing specifically within that fairly short analysis of Merrigan's that I disagree with, I, I, I don't think it's fully adequate and there's um, aspects of pluralism that he himself overlooks. It's nonetheless interesting. Okay, so I'm going to begin to try and outline this, what I hope is a helpful schema. Again, people might disagree, and um, I'd be really interested in hearing counter positions. So I think the first thing to distinguish is between factual pluralism, pluralism as a fact, as a social fact, and normative pluralism. OK, uh, so factual pluralism just means that pluralism in society is a fact. There uh, obtains a plurality of, in our case, different beliefs and worldviews, and that's just a fact. OK, what you do with that fact as part of an argument and how it might be used as a premise is one thing, but it's just a fact and it's hard to deny. Well, one shouldn't deny it. OK, and then as distinct from that, there's normative uh, pluralism. Uh, and this is whereby pluralism is considered a norm in the sense that it's not just a fact of something, but it's how one ought to do something, how one ought to approach something, how one ought to behave as regards something. So it's it's normative. It, it therefore entails an ought. OK, so factual pluralism is just simply a matter of fact. Normative pluralism is the idea that we should be pluralistic in such and such an area. We should be pluralistic as regards this particular matter. That's that's, I think, a foundational distinction to be aware of. OK, now within normative pluralism, I think there is a first and second order type of pluralism. OK, and again, the context here is education, in particular, ORI, OK, which is a, a very distinctive aspect of education, religious education, because it connotes things like ethos and rights, parental rights and so on and so forth. So within normative pluralism, there are two types, first, first order normative pluralism and second order normative pluralism. First order normative pluralism uh, concerns the pluralist teaching of Ori, while second order normative pluralism concerns a pluralist system of school provision. They're different things. They're different things. OK, um, I'm, when I talk about second order and first order, I'm trading a little bit on uh, Joseph Raz's um, just you have it here, Joseph Raz's distinction between um, uh, first order and second order reasons. OK, so it's 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 kind of extending that a little bit. OK, so first order uh, pluralism concerns a pluralist approach to teaching RE and second order pluralism concerns the idea of a school system that is pluralist in that it allows and permits uh, a pluralistic types of schools, a variety of schools within the school system. I'm suggesting there's a hierarchy here in the sense of authority uh, and in this sense that unless you have second order pluralism, then you will be massively restricted in the sorts of pluralism you can have at the first order teaching or E level. Uh, so I would say that for those of us who are concerned about pluralism, it's a package deal. 
uh, I, I, to be concerned only about first order pluralism and to say, well, second order pluralism doesn't matter. I, I don't, I doubt the coherence of that position, I suppose. Okay. Now, to make it even more complex, I'm, I'm suggesting that within first order pluralism, uh, there are a plurality of uh, uh, approaches available um, that can be taken. Second order pluralism is binary. It's either you have second order pluralism or you don't. If you don't have second order pluralism, you've got a, a monistic system of school provision. It's all, let's say, state schools. It's all, let's say, Catholic schools. It's all whatever. It's one thing. But in the first order sphere, um, there's pluralism within pluralism. OK, so I'm going to just try and categorize these according to three types. All right, try and categorize them according to three types here. I think there are um, these three types, descriptive pluralism, then you can have distinct from that phenomenological slash identity formation pluralism, and then distinct from that again, propositional uh, pluralism. OK, so all of these are types of pluralistic approaches to, again, ORE. OK, so it's not just that there's one pluralistic approach to ORE, there are different types of pluralistic approaches to ORE. What do I mean by pluralistic approach? I simply mean in the context of ORE, an approach that engages a plurality of belief systems, religions and worldviews. It's not just focusing on one belief or worldview. So I distinguish a pluralistic first order um, ORE from particularized ORE. So particularized ORE would take Hinduism, Christianity or something like that as a single worldview and focus solely on that. OK, which can be done, is often done at various levels historically, will be done in future, no doubt. So that's particularized ORE and I'm distinguishing that from a pluralist ORE which engages a plurality of different uh, worldviews in the midst of its teaching. OK, so descriptive, uh, phenomenological uh, slash identity formation and propositional. OK, so hopefully that's uh, seeping in. It's um, and I know there's a lot of categorization here, hopefully not tripping over myself and creating all sorts of unreal illusory distinctions. I do think these are real distinctions. Uh, again, you might disagree. OK, so they are first order pluralisms. So to return to this, this is the kind of the um, excerpt I began with. Three invocations of pluralism and um, any ideas as to what types of pluralisms are being invoked here. If we just make it fairly simple and say you've got factual pluralism, you've got first order pluralism, and you've got second order pluralism. Any ideas as to whether these are all one of those types or whether each of those three types is represented by each of these three invocations of pluralism? Any takers? Well, I have a coffee. <laughs> it's just like teaching. <laughs> so um, that's fine. It's um, I'm going heavy with the categories. So I'm just going to my own view is that the first invocation of pluralism. It, it, it's told that the, the authors are talking about factual pluralism. They're talking about pluralism within society. The second invocation of pluralism where it's talking about um, the right enshrined in Article 2, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights is second order pluralism. It's pluralism of school provision. It's talking about the rights of parents to choose an education for the children in conformity with their religious, philosophical and moral beliefs. That's second order pluralism. And then the final invocation of pluralism here is first order pluralism, where it's talking about a particular approach to teaching ORE. OK, so there are three types of pluralisms being invoked here. They're very different. I think the authors conflate them and we'll see later on again with the in terms of the logical problem that creates, I think, for them on this occasion. Um, and I think what I've done so far, it does correspond to real uh, important, I, I suggest, distinctions about pluralism. OK, let's examine each of these three types in a little bit more detail. So we've got factual pluralism, then we're going to look at uh, first order pluralisms. That's the most complex part because there's many of them. And then we look at second order pluralism. Factual pluralism, I think, is just very easy to deal with simply in the sense, excuse me, it's a given. You know, it's a given. It's just so hard to deny. OK, um, it's not that Ireland is the most pluralistic country in the world. It simply isn't. If anyone has gone anywhere else, I mean, lots of other countries are far more pluralistic. And it's not the case that Ireland is pluralistic in every way. I mean, there are different, let's say, strata of society that are less 
pluralistic uh, in terms of beliefs and diverse worldviews and so on and so forth. But overall, there's pluralism within Ireland, uh, you know, in terms of beliefs, different types of Christians, uh, different types of theists, different types of um, atheists and agnostic, different types of Eastern uh, mystical religions um, and so on. You know, it's, it's just hard to deny. OK, and different types of political philosophies and so on and moral systems. OK, so factual pluralism is a given. So let's move on then to something that is a bit more <clears throat> controversial and deserves a little bit more attention. Normative pluralism at the first order level. So first order pluralisms. The defining feature, again, of a first order pluralism as an approach to teaching already is that it engages with the plurality of worldviews. OK, so not just religious can be more widely speaking philosophical, uh, such that different types of atheisms would fit into that car uh, category. So it's distinguished from particularized ORI. And I've said uh, or proposed that there are three types. So we're going to look at each of these three types in turn, and I'm going to look, uh, we're going to look at them under the same headings and um, character, aims, presuppositions, and implications, okay? And they're different. Obviously, there's going to be some overlap between these, especially with the first two, but they're different. And um, I think their differences matter for, among other things, second order pluralism. Okay, so again, there's always this connection, first and second order pluralism. So let's take descriptive pluralism first up. So under this type of pluralistic approach, the emphasis on describing accurately a plurality of belief systems. And descriptions are usually in terms of belief content, belief practices, historical development and cultural and socio-political influences. Okay, um, the a type of neutrality is adopted and it's a sociological neutrality. Okay, so facts are valued and what's bracketed, what's put in abeyance, uh, so to speak, is judgments judgments about the validity or worth or truth of these different um, belief systems that are being investigated. So it's a type of positivist approach to uh, ORI. OK, so this is a descriptive pluralism. The aims, um, there, are, there are a few I'm picking out that I think are probably the most important for this form of pluralist ORI. Uh, to increase knowledge of diverse worldviews, and that's a kind of a means towards contributing towards uh, students' rounded fact knowledge base, uh, but also to promoting tolerance, respect, social inclusivity and social harmony. Uh, and social harmony you can break down in terms of promotion of individual rights and communal peace. OK, so there are the aims. Presuppositions. And I suppose one can't speak about presuppositions without understanding the context of what's being pre of what's being proposed. So the, the, again, bear in mind when we're talking about religious education, it's a subsection of education, and education is that mode of interaction, human interaction, whereby important truths are passed on from um, those who possess those truths uh, and those learnings to others who don't. OK, so it's an educational context and within education, the passing on of, of important truths and you can some grade truth in various ways. So passing on important truths is very important. So the presuppositions um, that I think are most important for the kind of what I want to do here today uh, is uh, the two of them that I want to pick out are as follows. Religious and philosophical truth is either unimportant or else objectively unknowable, because again, the context is education. So we're trying to say, well, here are important things to know. And the descriptive approach is bracketing the question of truth, reasoning, judgments about uh, validity and, and warrant and justifiability and so on and so forth. So the presupposition would seem to be that religious and philosophical truth is either unimportant or else unknowable. Another presupposition is that religious philosophical worldviews are primarily important as regards socio-political influence, socio-political identity, and social harmony. They're, I think, the two most important presuppositions uh, for I suppose, the line of argument I'm making here today. That's not to say that there aren't other presuppositions. There are, but they're the ones I want to focus on. Implications then, implications. 
<clears throat> if they're the presuppositions and if it's uh, this if this is the pluralist approach to RE, where all we're doing is describing, we're just describing different beliefs, we're describing different practices, and we're not doing any more, we're deliberately not doing any more in an educational context. This implies either an agnostic or a relativistic account of religious and philosophical truth. And I suppose the a way to kind of see this, if one doesn't see this immediately, is to kind of um, just, you, you know, uh, engage in a thought experiment. Imagine we weren't doing religion here or weren't doing wider philosophical worldviews. Imagine we're, we're discussing a plurality of ethical positions on war or on consent as regards sex or uh, in terms of truth telling when it comes to business dealings. And we're looking at a range of different views of these and all we're willing to do is describe them in an education context and we refrain from making judgments. Well, that implies to the student who's paying any sort of attention or even not that we're presupposing actually all those views. There's not really much to say in terms of whether one's superior to another or in fact, you just mightn't be able to say whether one is superior to another. OK, so again, this is a purely descriptive account and this is an implication it has for the idea of religious and philosophical truth. So what's what's kind of implied then to the, to the student, to the learner, is a secular, uh, flat, emaciated understanding of religion. So religion's real, actual, transcendent dimension is overlooked or else it's implicitly denied. Religion is understood as a purely social, temporal phenomenon only. Um, and what's implicitly rejected then in all of this is religion as a basic good of human well-being, whereby one seeks to find truth about ultimate reality and ultimate meaning, and on the basis of one's best judgments, to conform one's life to that truth and meaning in order to attain ultimate, perhaps even eternal, fulfillment. In all of this, when I mention religion, I'm not using it in a denominational sense. I'm referring to religion as that mode of human endeavor and human interest whereby we try and find out truth about what ultimate existence is like so we can conform to that truth to flourish as people. So I, I at least intend, I intend to include atheism under this idea of religion. OK, uh, so it's not denominational. Uh, any sort of philosophical reflective atheism, I think, can be accommodated under this definition of, of religion. So examples of this type of descriptive ORE, the Toledo Guiding Principles on Teaching About Religion and Beliefs in Public Schools, European Ethics uh, from the NCCA 2015, and some key areas within the proposed revised primary curriculum framework, uh, NCCA 2020. I'm, I'm proposing that these are all examples, uh, more or less, of a descriptive approach to pluralist ORE. OK, if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to just jump in. I'm going to go on uh, in the absence of those. So the second one, the second pluralist story that I want to look at is a phenomenological identity formation approach to Ori. OK, so its character is a dual focus. One is on the experience, the experience of having and living a worldview. And the second is on the meaning, the meaning and potential a worldview has for students' identities. And uh, within that is included their sense of self, their sense of self-esteem, and a capacity to make sense of the world. Whereas within descriptive pluralism, a sort of sociological neutrality is adopted. Within phenomenological identity formation pluralism, a sort of phenomenological neutrality is adopted. Okay, so there is certainly a valuing of the intentional phenomena of religions and worldview. Uh, religions and worldviews, uh, the, the phenomena that appears to those who intentionally engage and think and possess and live by worldviews. So this includes the phenomena of meaning, what it means for them. Also valued as reflective understanding of worldviews. Uh, and obviously within this goes without saying that there's, this, there's a real interiority is, is valued as well. And this is very much different from the descriptive worldview or the, the descriptive approach to pluralist story. However, bracketed are the same <clears throat> considerations that are bracketed by descriptive worry, namely reasoning, reasoning, not just reflection, but reasoning towards truth uh, and towards intellectual judgments concerning what is true or false or more or less true and more or less false. Also bracketed 
is the proposing of a particular worldview as objectively true and as possessing a meaning that fully corresponds to reality as a whole, that fully corresponds, okay? Um, just a side point here, um, the, dis the distinction I'm kind of relying on here between underst understanding and meaning on the one hand <clears throat> and reasoning and judgment on the other is based on, partly based on the work of Bernard Lonergan, uh, his, his, his really, really great work, uh, <clears throat> Insight. The aims of this approach, similar in some ways to the descriptive pluralist approach, so to increase awareness of meaning and diversity of worldviews, and this can be an end in itself, and it can also be a means to the end of contributing towards students' rounded grasp of diverse identities and searches for meanings. Another aim is to foster autonomy of, uh, autonomy towards, and confidence in students' self-identities. So that's why it's, it's identity formation as well as a phenomenological pluralism. The promotion of a reflective valuing of religious and philosophical worldviews as a generic class, because again, we're not judging any of them more or less valid or more or less warranted or more or less uh, well established historically, philosophically and so on. But as a gener generic class, religious and philosophical views uh, are promoted um, in the sense that uh, their reflective valuing is considered a good. Uh, another aim is the increase increasing students' empathy towards diverse worldviews. And again, that could be a means towards an end for tolerance, social inclusive, inclusivity, respect, and so on. Okay. What are the presuppositions? Well, again, I think they're similar uh, for present purposes to the main presuppositions alluded to uh, that underpin the descriptive approach. Because again, reasoning towards judgments about truth and falsity and so on, and the proposition of some worldview as objectively true, they're both deliberately bracketed, okay? So religious and philosophical truth, as distinct from religious philosophical understanding and meaning, they're not the same thing. One can understand something and understand what it means, but at the same time judging it deficient in terms of credibility. So they're not the truth and understanding, I mean, they're, they're not the same thing. Um, Religion and philosophical truth is either unimportant because bracketed or else objectively unknowable because again, unbracketed. So absent from this approach is an affirmation, even a, a conditional non-committal affirmation of a particular meaning to life that corresponds to transcendent reality. Okay. Another presupposition here is that religious philosophical worldviews are primarily important as regards individual self-identity, reflectivity, a social political identity and social harmony. So I'm distinguishing here when I talk about self identity, I'm distinguishing here between the identity that one wants to create for oneself or the identity that one wants to see as oneself possessing, distinguishing between that sort of self identity from an identity that one actually has in relation to a transcendent source of all identity. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, for example, some of the epistles, letters in the, in the in New Testament refer to the latter type of identity, the new self in Christ, for example, Paul speaks about. The view of identity here, I think this is important in telling, the view of identity where it's self-identity uh, is, is really that of a contemporary liberalism, contemporary liberal um, political philosophy, uh, in particular, if you read the work of someone like Ronald Dworkin, um, you know, who who has an awful lot to say about this uh, and he's you know put a lot of thought into it kind of subtly and powerfully. That's the sort of view of identity. You see a bit of it in Rawls as well, William Galston and so on. Uh, contemporary political liberal authors, credible authors, you know, not just uh, popular popularizers or, or kind of journalistic opinion makers, but you know, real thinkers within contemporary liberalism. This is their view of identity, is this sort of view, okay? Again, the implications from those sort of presuppositions and the bracketing of what's been bracketed, the implications are similar to the, the descriptive approach, either an agnostic or relativistic account of religious and philosophical truth. That's what's been implied. Either we don't know in terms of we, any religious philosophy, we don't know if there's any truth because that's all been bracketed. Reasoning towards that has all been bracketed. Either we don't know agnosticism or relativism they're all pretty much the same in terms of truth, which logically means they're all roughly false because they can't all be equally true. Something can be equally false, but it can't be equally true once they're once they conflict. Uh, and so this promotes then or this implies a subjectivist account of meaning and identity. 
And so overall, it's a very subjectivist account of religion and philosophy generally and worldviews generally that's been promoted. OK, uh, it's a very subjectivist account. Um, and that ties in with that sort of phenomenological self-identity formation um, character. It's, 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 it's heavily subjectivist. That doesn't mean to say that this pluralism as an approach to teaching RE is no better than the descriptive approach. I think it's superior in many respects. It's more interior. It's more human. Uh, it, it is more of a sense of the profundity of the religious quest and the philosophical quest. Uh, but it still has these implications that I think um, will and ought to be denied uh, by uh, anyone who affirms some, let's say, revelation or some philosophical position as in the final analysis. Uh, better justified, more credible, more credible, more true than alternative uh, propositions. Examples of this approach, I think it's the main thrust of Levin Bouvier's philosophy of religious education. I mean, you know, there, there are elements on what Bouvier is doing that um, kind of qualifiers here and there that suggest he's trying to not kind of fully collapse what he's doing into this, but I think it's pretty much the main thrust. I think it's a big part of the new junior cycle of religious education spec from the NCCA. Uh, and I'd suggest that it's, it's, it's quite prevalent even among, um, implicitly, even among lots of thinkers, Catholic thinkers, Christian thinkers within ORE, who on the one hand do want to say that, you know, there, there is something uniquely true. That, you know, for example, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is something uniquely true, but it's, I think it's very easy, very tempting for all of us to kind of, kind of go into this sort of identity formation, phenomenological approach by a sort of default. It's understandable. Um, it's understandable, and I, th I think it does happen quite a bit. In terms of the relation of B to A, I've already spoken about that. I'll send on these, to anyone who's interested, these, these slides later on. I better skip on because I'm probably already, oh my word, right, eating into this time. Okay, um, this is going on for, I hope to be a bit further down the path at this point. Okay. The final version then is the propositional version of, of pluralist, pluralist story. Its character, it engages with a priority of worldviews partly, partly by way of proposing and explaining the unique truth work of one among them. Not fully by way, not exclusively by way, not wholly by way, okay? It's not the only reason that pluralism is adopted under a propositional approach. There's a value in pluralism beyond propositional value, but partly by way of proposing and explaining the unique truth worth of one, uh, one among them. The propositional dimension to this form of ORE is it's intentional and it's accomplished via the only way suitable to accomplishing the proposing of something is true. It's accomplished via reasoning and explanation, not via mere assertion, okay? So this is not kind of, um, you know, hammer and tongs catechesis. This is not the uh, the Christian brothers' demonstration of the falsity of of uh, of um, of uh, what's the opposite to realism, <laughs> idealism, whereby the Christian brother grabs the young student by the ear and hits his head off desk to demonstrate the falsity of um, of idealism. Uh, it's 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 propositional. Uh, not impositional and it's not assertive, it's it's done through reasoning and explanation, which involves counterposition, which involves debate, which involves discur discursive dialogue, okay? So critical reasoning within this is, is crucial. It's a non-negotiable, there has to be critical reasoning, okay? And there's no way for a student to go through this without their critical reasoning skills being developed once it's truly propositional in this sense, okay? So, um, it's also important to point out at this uh, at this juncture, propositional or e, whether it's done in a particularized way or in a pluralistic way, um, it doesn't have to be Christian. Okay, I suppose I'd be most interested in the, in the Christian approach to propositional, but it can be atheistic. It, it, it can be uh, it can be Jewish, it can be Muslim, uh, Confucian, uh, it can be other other types of. Uh, Christianity outside of uh, Catholic, okay? All, I'm making a very general distinction and categorization here. A propositional approach to ORE, pluralistic or otherwise, can be from any uh, worldview that wants to propose itself as 
as uniquely justified, credible, or true. Okay. Aims to develop students' capacity to find harmony with ultimate truth by proposing two things. First of all, that religious and philosophical truth is real and of momentous importance and attainable. Okay. Because we can all pay lip service to that idea, but unless we're actually kind of intentionally saying it, then it's not going to seem intellectually uh, convincing or intellectually meaningful. And the second aspect is by proposing a particular worldview as uniquely true. OK, so again, if all we're doing is saying generically there's religious and philosophical truth available, but we're refraining from saying, well, actually, this is it. This is this is what we can reasonably take to be to be the fullness of truth. Uh, unless that kind of particularized proposition is put forward, then the, the initial proposition that such truth is available is rather generic and formal and empty. The other aim is to develop students' capacity for critical reasoning, which is more than just simply saying to them, please reflect on this. It's actually engaging them with reasoning about uh, aspects of philosophy, aspects about religion, to form true judgments or to form better judgments or more adequate judgments or more reasonable uh, judgments. Another aim, because this is a pluralist type of RE, because it's engaging with world views, um, is to increase respect for religion and philosophy and that quest, the religious and philosophical quest, as supremely important, a supremely important mode of human activity and well-being. And this is done with a view to promoting respect for all of those who seek uh, religious and philosophical truth, whether one agrees with them or not, whether they, one thinks that they're partially or fully uh, or, or no, way, no, in no way at all in attainment of that truth, and also to promote the unique importance, not just generic importance, but the unique importance in particular of the rights to freedom of religion, conscience, association, speech and thought. OK, and the idea that these rights are more than just aspects of generic autonomy rights, that they're supremely important because the concern and protect. One of, if not the most important aspects of human existence, this search for ultimate meaning, uniquely human, uniquely human and profound uh, and, and important. And those rights in particular protect that, whereas more generic autonomy rights might just protect your right to uh, be able to choose one pack of crisps over another. Presuppositions. Religious and philosophical truth is both important and noble. OK, um, another presupposition is that unlike what both A and B presuppose, reason is capable of examining and perhaps even supporting faith. Uh, neither A nor B, I maintain, give sufficient credence to the compatibility and interdependence of faith and reason. Uh, another presupposition is, is that religion is not just a matter of social fact or self-identity or experience. I mean, it's bound up in those things, sure, but it's not just a matter of those, it's not just reducible to those. Religion is the way by which one can find transcendent fulfillment, or at least an existential settlement, if you're, if you're coming at it from a, like a, an atheistic existentialist point of view, Sartre or Camus or Heidegger, with the ultimate source of meaning. Implications, the, obviously the implication that stands out is that uh, religious and philosophical truth is real and attainable and objectively noble. Uh, another implication is that it acknowledges a vertical transcendent dimension to religion. OK, so religion is not just a matter of social, temporal, subjective phenomena, that there's it, it's it, it's about what transcends all of those as well. In fact, it is focally about what transcends all of those. OK, however, one might wish to understand what transcends all of those. One could call it Gaia, one could call it the One, one could call it Allah uh, or, or um, you know, being, OK? But it's, it is a matter of transcending all of those. Examples, I'm not sure of any examples. Perhaps I've missed some in my very brief preparation uh, for this, but I don't think it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's extant, at least in the way I understand how it could be uh, done. Um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, what, what is the relationship between a, a propositional pluralist approach to RE and the approach, uh, the pluralist approach of A and B? They're not compatible if A and B are done in isolation and are done in the way that they're in the way of bracketing religious truth and reasoning and so forth. But A and B can be made compatible if lexical normative priority is given to is given to C. 
So if lexical normative priority is given to a propositional pluralism, then a descriptive pluralism and a phenomenological pluralism can be part of that sort of curriculum uh, as well. And, and in that way, A, B and C can be made coherent, but only if uh, lexical normative priority is given to proposition, a propositional approach. OK, that's just again a reminder of how uh, they fit together, A, B and C. Carly, will you kindly tell me to shut up um, when I've gone uh, gone over the board here? I'm going to just plow on uh, for the moment anyway and try and get a little bit of second order pluralism covered. OK, so that's a reminder of the relationship. I think second order has an authoritative um, uh, relation to first order pluralism because you can't have a plurality of first order pluralisms without second order pluralism existing. So again, second order pluralism concerns uh, uh, the, the case where there is legal and political autonomy for a variety of school types to teach RE in a certain way in line with their own ethos. That's second order pluralism. If that sort of pluralism is not permitted or if it's not practically support, supported, then the educational system that obtains is monist, not pluralist, it's monism. Uh, so what second order pluralism does, it makes a range of first order or e pluralisms practically possible. OK, so no second order pluralism. If there's no second order pluralism, it means that a single first order approach to or e, whether it's pluralist or otherwise, will be coercively required by the state of all schools insofar as they teach uh, or e, or at least all publicly funded schools. Uh, and that coercively mandated first order or e may or may not be a pluralist or e, OK? But if there's no uh, second order pluralism, it means that there'll be a single first order approach to or e that will be mandated for all school types within the uh, system. Why should there be second order pluralism? Uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on, C on Civil and uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the European Convention of Human Rights in the various articles affirm and acknowledge the parental right to educational choice. And that's um, that's basically what's been affirmed there is second order pluralism. Now, that's not sufficient reason for thinking that second order pluralism is justified. I try here very briefly to give an outline, a very rough brief outline of the justification, the, the normative justification for second order pluralism. I don't have time to go through it there, but a helpful book in this regard is Melissa Moschella's uh, To Whom Do Children Belong, published by Cambridge University Press in about 2017. OK, and um, Carly, am I able to go on for another minute or will I, will I just um, sure, sure, that's fine. Go on, Tom. You're in full flow. Well done. Right. OK, OK. Um, so there, there's different ways. I'm just going to turn attention to the ways in which there could be an indirect extinguishing of second order pluralism. And again, this involves how various first order pluralisms could be inflated or reduced. And um, because it'd be very obvious if a state came along and said, look, only one type of school is going to be allowed and that's it. I mean, that's an obvious extinction of second order pluralism. But there were indirect ways in which uh, second order pluralism can be in, 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 uh, extinguished. Uh, I'm going to look at two ways. First way is inflating a first order pluralism to suffice as a second order pluralism. So here, a first order pluralism is mandated for all schools as a way of discharging the, state, the state's obligations towards the provision of a pluralist education system. Uh, this is a category error. Um, because it doesn't discharge the obligation towards second order pluralism. It entails a monistic, a monist educational system. Uh, 